by trying to put you all in the mindset that I was in when I was asked to work on Living Social's SEO. Since at that time, my responsibilities were mainly focused on back-end work to support our merchants, I had a lot of research to do before I could even look at any code. As a back-end developer, the extent of my SEO knowledge was pretty much, isn't that something marketing worries about? Um, so as we often do in this industry, I turned to my good friend Google. So today I want to share with you the steps that I took to learn a little bit more about SEO in the hopes that you can then go and implement these steps frustration free. After all, SEO is not a four letter word. And as a teacher, yes, I'm very familiar with all sorts of words that my students would say. They're teenagers, so, you know. Huh. <laughs> um, so we'll start by taking a look at what SEO means in a general sense. We'll then um, dive into why providing good structured data to search engines is important for page rankings. There are two forms of structured data that we'll take a look at, microdata and JSON-LD. Um, we'll explore two tools that Google provides to aid you in your quest, Google Search Console and the Structured Data Testing Tool. Finally, we'll arrive at the importance of JSON-LD in your Rails app. This process echoes my own path as I explored sort of what type of structured data would best improve our search results. I want a little aside here. I don't know if there are any country music fans in the room. Probably not a high number. I keep hearing Jason Aldean when I say Jason Aldean and just, um, yeah, somebody, I, I knew that wasn't going to fly very far, but I, I was like, maybe there's somebody in the room um, that would know something about that. So SEO, or search engine optimization, is the process of getting traffic to your website via the natural or free results from a search engine. That is to say, results that aren't like those first you know, three ads you might see when you type something into Google. And while you can't control the algorithms that search engines use to present your site to users, there are a number of ways that you can boost your site's visibility. You can have a site that has a logical architecture. You can ensure that your site is using enough relevant keywords. And you can uh, ensure that you have content on your site that matches up with search terms that people might use, among other things. So at this point, you've already learned about as much about SEO as I knew when I started. So it's then time to take a deep dive into what I needed to do to improve our page rankings. So SEO is an umbrella that covers many different ones, including the ones on all these screens. Um, and we'd be here for weeks if I talked about every single one of these. So I want to focus on one section in particular, how it can directly affect the ranking of your site or page. So search engines can and do pick up on keywords in place like your title um, or your meta tags, but they can only get you so far in rankings. Even if the title is very specific to the page, like yeah, Insignia 0 0.7 cubic foot microwave black Best Buy, on Best Buy's site, pay very close attention to that one, that's not enough detailed information to pique a user's interest if they've Googled, say, inexpensive microwaves. You're going to be lumped in with every other site that is selling or has sold cheap microwaves and probably ranked a fair bit behind most. Um, users want to know things like the price or ratings for products, for example, the address for a concert venue, or that a restaurant is an inexpensive, family-friendly wine bar, not a real example, I don't know any, um, before they spend their time investigating further on your site. So when we talk about the kind of data uh, that you want to surface to a search engine, we're talking about structured data, which is organized in a predictable and logical manner. Search engines can easily digest this data, as I know, for example, that a product is going to have a price and a name, or that an event will have a venue, but maybe will only sometimes have a performer if it's like a musical or a theatrical type event. A search engine will expect certain data depending on what context that you're using, and contexts aren't wildly different, but they do have some different uh, expectations. It's sort of like telling Spellcheck, hey, I'm about to use Spain Spanish in this document, um, so don't bring up errors or don't expect certain words or phrases that only show up in Chilean Spanish, for example. So the first step for me was to check and see what our existing structures look like. If someone spent time working on your app's SEO before, you might have, have existing data, but it might have errors. If your data hasn't been touched in a while, which in tech speak is like two years, I guess, um, 
you probably have a format called microdata. It consists of name value pairs, known as items, defined according to a context. The standard and most common context is provided by schema.org. So microdata is an open community HTML uh, specification that's used to nest the structured data within an HTML context. Um, it's got some basic syntax that you'll see no matter what context you're using uh, to define your items, like item scope. Item scope is used to define an item, uh, such as in the first line, if you kind of can't see it in the, um, this one. You can sort of see a little better over there. Um, item scope is basically telling um, the search engine, okay, an item is coming up, and I'm about to tell you what to expect from it. Item type reveals a specific type of the item as well as what context you're using. In this case, the first item is going to be a product as defined by schema.org, um, which is where I got this example. Item prop describes uh, an attribute of the item. In this case, the item prop name for this product is Dell UltraSharp 30-inch LCD monitor. Some item types will require certain attributes, um, such as an aggregate rating property, which requires a rating value, a best rating, and a rating count, while other attributes will be optional. You can see that all of this data, even in the slightly blurry image, uh, that all of this data that is being exposed to the search engine is right there in among the HTML that a browser will render for users, which makes it a bit hard to kind of pick out what the specific structure of the data is and separate that from what it is that the user is seeing. So once I familiarized myself with our microdata and learned where we defined it in our views, the next step for me was then to find out what errors we had. And for that, I turned to Google Search Console. Google Search Console is a free service offered by Google that helps you monitor and maintain your site's presence in their search rankings. There are many things that you can do and track with the Search Console, but for the purposes of finding errors, the structured data section that's highlighted in red, um, under search appearance is most helpful. This particular example is taken from a Google image search, but you can see that this site is using the schema.org vocabulary for most of its products. Um, you can then drill down even further and look at the particular ones that have errors. So in this case, they have, what, 297 errors um, for 7,989 items on their site. So I started to work through items that had errors. Often these were events that weren't at a fixed venue, so it wasn't a venue name or a venue address. Or for other cases where mandatory data was being passed to nil property from our service side. Once I thought I had the right structure, I could then test production data um, locally with Google's structured data testing tool. Bit of a mouthful. So with the structured data testing tool, you can either test live data um, without affecting it, or test the sample structure to make sure that what um, you're building has all the right information before you code up a solution. So the left image is an example of microdata for a product, um, the same product I mentioned earlier. You can see that the two red X marks on the left and three orange triangles um, down that side, they indicate errors and warnings respectively. You don't have to fix warnings, um, but in most cases it's probably best that you do. So you can see in the image on the right that a rating count needs to, be, needs to be provided under the aggregate rating property. Basically tells it you know, how many reviews there are. Um, and that a name needs to be provided for the overall product. If this were a larger page and not just a section of it, you might see multiple products or product listings along with events or organization listings. A page can have any combination or any number of item types that reflect its content. So for example, on a recipe page, you might have, say, the text describing the recipe, along with a video of somebody preparing the recipe, and maybe contact information for the company. Each of these types would get their own representation, a recipe, a video object, and an organization, respectively. So when you fix any errors, you notice now that they're fixed, there's no more little warning flags on the side, you can replay the window to get it to analyze the new data. The preview button, that sort of greenish, bluish, depending on how it's shown up here, um, button in an error-free markup will show you what this item would look like for an actual Google search result. So I went through, made all the necessary code changes to fix the errors, 
deployed it, and went back to check the search console. But even after you fix things, you might initially see the same amount of errors as it takes Google a bit of time to crawl your site. Your error number should trend steadily down, however, if you fixed all the problems. Um, but you can always go back into the search console, look at an individual item just to make sure that that particular one doesn't have an error anymore. So I got to the stage of the process thinking, great, all the errors are fixed, so I'm done, right? Well, not so fast. While eliminating errors is a necessary step, it turns out that won't give you the greatest return if you're still using this microdata format. And I hadn't yet investigated whether there's any additional data that we could be surfacing to search engines. So at this point, you might be wondering, OK, this is at least a Ruby-ish conference. When's she going to talk about Ruby? This is where the fun part kicked in for me. As somebody who loves digging through databases, a code niffler, if you will, for all you Harry Potter fans, hopefully with slightly less destruction, um, it was kind of a treasure hunt of sorts to see what information do we have in our database, and in this case, a restaurant. If you've got a separate front-end app that is getting its data from a service, it's an opportunity to take a look and see if there's new information in the database that the service could be providing to your front end. Maybe you've got like longitude and latitude, latitude of the restaurant stored um, in your database, but you're not exposing that to the front end for some reason. That's something useful that you could add to your data structures. As far as the format of structured data goes, um, microdata is no longer preferred by search engines like Google. I say Google a lot, but it's the sort of how it's done is pretty much the same across different search engines. Um, instead, Google gives preference to something called JSON-LD, JavaScript Object Notation for Linked Data. It's called that because you're creating JSON that allows um, an application to start at one piece of linked data and follow embedded links to other, other pieces of linked data across the web. Um, so you might be following from your app to a restaurant's website or from your app to a ticket selling site to that band's website. Um, like microdata, JSON-LD consists of uh, properties and values that are defined according to a standard context. However, unlike microdata, uh, JSON, um, the markup does not have to be interleaved with the user visible text, which makes nested data items easier to express. So you can surface the same sort of complex structures you might have been using microdata for without worrying if it makes sense in a visual way to the users. So as you're digging through the database to see what further information you can provide to search engines, you can start to build out your own JSON structure with real data. Um, I recommend doing this before writing the code to generate this dynamically, just so you can check that Google will accept the structure as you've written it before you take the next step to translate it to Ruby. So one place to organize this dynamic creation of content is in a helper. You can call it what you like, so I think schema org is a pretty descriptive name, particularly if you're, that's the context that you're using, and avoids the slightest possibility of confusion with JSON that you might have elsewhere. Your JSON-LD tag is basically a more specific JavaScript tag um, that you're going to pass the data structure for your restaurant, or whatever else it is that you've converted to JSON. You might need to create other methods um, to conditionally add certain nested data, especially if it's more complex than a one-liner. This is more likely to happen in cases like events where if that event has a performer, however your backend determines that, you might want to add a smaller data structure with information about that performer, like their website, band members, um, and what have you. You can then insert it into the relevant um, show page where you like, well, often the show page, um, for the item or event by calling that JSON-LD tag that you've created. Uh, if you've got like a category or collection page, something where a group of these items are appearing, um, you could also add that method that will render you know, that JSON-LD for whatever objects are in the array that's related to that particular page. Um, the only caveat to doing this is the question of where do you want to drive your traffic. You, there's certainly reasons to want to drive it to like a category or collection page, um, but if what you're after is like getting that user to buy that microwave, getting a user to buy that one concert ticket or that one event ticket, um, I would focus your efforts more on the, the individual item in that sense. If you do go the route of doing this for like a category or collection page, um, you have to show the JSON-LD for every single item in that collection or else Google will flag it as a violation um, of its guidelines. 
So this all sounds like a pretty rosy picture, but what about your edge cases? We developers love our edge cases, or at least I do. Um, and I found in very short order that we had multiple situations where the data wasn't going to fit the structure that I created. For example, a website might not always have, I um, mean, a restaurant might not always have a website or menu URL. Still a common problem in this day and age. Um, you could tell that JSONLD method to add the URL only if it is present or unless it is blank. Um, if there's a nested data structure that might be incomplete or one that you need to or only allowed to express under certain conditions, you can create a method that will add that when the necessary conditions are met. That way it'll be in the JSONLD only when necessary and won't raise an error for malformed data when Google crawls your site. Um, so my digging through data ended up revealing information that seemed pretty useful to me, but that the schema.org um, context didn't have an established uh, representation for. What they do have is a kind of like a miscellaneous category um, for these particular cases, which is called appropriately additional property. Um, so at the moment, they don't have a representation for restaurant features, like if it's family friendly or it's private dining rooms or offers takeout, those kind of like tags. So I could create an additional property in the data structure with its related type of property value and give it a name of restaurant features and then list an array of all the features that restaurant has. So whether your views look more like the desk on the left or the desk on the right, and my actual desk, that's not my actual desk, but look close to one on the left, um, a huge advantage of using JSONLD like this is the organization. If you have to change something or add something, you're not searching for the item and the item scope that defines it, and then digging through nested partials to find all of the item props that describe its properties Instead, you can go right to your helper and adjust whatever is necessary. So another advantage to JSON-LD over microdata has to do with what are called rich cards or snippets. A rich card is a more engaging level of presentation because it improves the standard search result with a more structured and visual preview of things that you describe with your markup. So for example, a recipe card, as you can kind of see here um, on the left, shows the host site for that recipe a picture of that recipe, a snippet of information about it, and a star rating. All attributes that are most compelling to a user that is searching for that recipe. And while Google will still evaluate sites that use microdata for its rich cards and snippets, um, they recommend using JSON-LD as it just makes nested data items much easier to express, such as the country of a postal address, of a music venue, of an event. Um, it helps Google better surface all of that to users. So this is not a cure-all, and it can be particularly tough to climb the search rankings if you're in a busy or generalized market. Um, a mom and pop pet supply store that goes from no structured data to adding JSON-LD to their site, it's not gonna all of a sudden see their site show up in the first couple pages of Google search results by providing only basic information, but they can gain some headway by emphasizing what makes their business unique or sets it apart and providing as much information as possible with the caveat of don't provide too much in case it's not relevant. Um, so if that same mom and pop store is making handmade hemp dog outfits, then highlighting that instead of talking about themselves more generically as selling pet supplies um, can boost their rankings over competitors that don't have similar structures. That is assuming that you're searching for handmade hemp dog outfits. And of course, large companies have more time and money uh, to throw at getting more of their users' time and money so like many things, it can be tough to be a small fish in the SEO pond. However, fixing and improving your structured data is a great time investment that will only have a positive effect. Broken data at best won't be factored in by Google's algorithms, and at worst it might set off a red flag if Google thinks that you're trying to deceive both them and users by showing something different in the views than you are rendering to Google's algorithms. Um, So in my case, removing what wasn't necessary or fixing the broken microdata and then converting everything to JSON-LD resulted in a full page and a half jump for some results based on the exact same search terms used. So I can't promise that following the same process will have the same effect for you. It might be more, it might be less. But now <laughs> there are two more tools that you can add to your toolkit to in help investigate your search rankings. With the Google Search Console, 
and the structured data testing tool, you can ensure that both you and Google are on the same page. And while, again, I've spoken mostly, um, mainly about Google, working towards their standards will help your rankings in other search engines as well. And even if you're happy with your page ranking and you're using microdata, converting to JSON-LD will neaten up your views and make more complex nested data structures easier to express. Future you will thank you. And I thank you as well. Um, I'll share this later so you don't have to hurriedly Google what Google thinks of all this. Um, thank you again.